this is a really good session now. We're talking about range anxiety. So I really think it's an important topic that we need to discuss. We've got three amazing speakers here to talk about this. Can I please welcome onto stage Graham Cooper from the National Grid, Victor Malachard from Book My Charge, and Matt Allen from Pivot Power. So the very first, I can remember the very first time I drove an, an electric car any distance was a Mitsubishi iMeve, and I drove it from Birmingham to where I live, which was 72 miles, and I had real full-on actual dripping sweat range anxiety. I thought, it's not going to make it. I'd never driven a car, electric car that far, and I could see the bars going down on the little iMeve as I was going along the M5, going, I won't make it. I've got to go up the hill because I live up a high hill. It's never going to do it. And then when I got home, I went, oh, I did make it, but I didn't know it was. But I genuinely had proper, genuinely terrifying, this is going to run out on the motorway range anxiety. And then it faded. And I think I've heard that story a lot from a lot of different people who drive electric cars. The first time you drive it, because you've been told you'll have range anxiety, you do have it. But I think what we're talking about really is how we mitigate that and how we can move beyond that where it actually... Because technically it's not an issue. Most journeys are much shorter... Than, than we imagine, and, and electric cars are very capable of doing that. But Matt, I want to start with you because what Pivot Power is suggesting is clearly a, a big solution to this, but the, the potential of charging when you're out on the road. Yeah, definitely. I mean, our, our focus is on the provision and the access of, of power. Um, I think the, the example that I use and when I explained to my wife what we were doing, saying you know, the, the the direction of travel and the desire for rapid charging in a 350 kilowatt charger and a 500 kilowatt charger, one of those 350 watt kilowatt chargers, that's as much power that's required from a B&Q superstore. Oh, up, there we go. Okay, gotcha. All right. Oh, uh, you got all right. One charger, B&Q superstore. Two of those you know, would be an IKEA, and so that's obviously a scale problem. And so, where we are right now is in a solid foundational place, but for this to really take off and scale, we need to address those power, those power issues. Um, so that's the big focus on our side, is looking at deploying big, large batteries into the market and deploying that, that power that we're unlocking. And when you say large batteries, what size are you talking about? Yeah, so 50, well, 49.9 megawatts. Um, from a, a footprint standpoint, that's about half of a football pitch. Right. Um, oh, so, God, so huge, physically those, big. Well, they, yeah. they are, yeah, they are big. These are basically, you know, containers uh, that yeah. will be uh, sitting adjacent to National Grid uh, substations um, where there is that excess power that's required to be put into the market. And now, Victor, what you're running is Book My Charge, which is, is that more people who, who've got a charger that say, do you want to come and charge your car at my house? Is that the kind of underlying idea? Yeah, so Book My Charge um, is a marketplace that connects electric vehicle owners with bookable charge points. So we're, we're absolutely in the business of reducing that range anxiety that every electric vehicle owner has uh, experienced at some point. Um, if you look at the uh, infrastructure that's out there today, it's lagging behind quite considerably the adoption of EV. I mean, there's only 150,000 or so EVs today. Um, there's just over 15,000 public charge points. So that's a network contention of 10 to 1. Um, so what our job today is make it bookable to give that, that certainty that all uh, drivers want that when they get to a destination they can book and recharge their car but also mobilize the home own charge point network. 85,000 of the char electric chargers in the market today are home owned and so you know, as a community we need to make that available. Um, you know, it's very much the Airbnb model, um, the shared economy model, um, and if by doing that you're reducing range anxiety, we're going to fast track the adoption of electric vehicles. Now, Graham, the great thing that we hear is if, if all you people with electric cars plug them all in, you're going to melt the grid and we're going to have to build 50 new size well Bs or whatever. It, uh, can you explain how the National Grid is preparing for the, adopt, the mass adoption of electric vehicles? Yeah, absolutely. If you, if you follow the Daily Mail expression of electric vehicles... I didn't want to mention we're, that We're going to need five new nuclear power stations in about three weeks' time. Right. So, um, one of the things to think about is, is the principle of diversity, OK? We don't all do things all at the same time. So if we all went home and all switched on the electric oven, that would be a, you know, all at the same time, that would be a challenge. 
In the same way with car charging, we will not all arrive home at five and not all plug in at five. So to an extent, the problem is nowhere near the problem that people think. Um, so diversity is a really important thing. So I charge an electric car maybe once a week. My neighbor opposite, he charges his electric car maybe once a week. So it's not really a huge challenge. As we get greater numbers of cars arriving at home and charging, charging will need to get smart. Because at the moment, we use energy in the country. They call it the duck curve. We all get up in the morning, we make toast, tea, then go to work, energy power levels fall. And then we all come home and cook dinner and power levels go up. So if you just keep adding electric car charging at six o'clock on a wet Wednesday, well, that's really inefficient because you'd have to build more power stations. But if you can charge when you know, the country is using less, then that's just really smart. It just makes sense. We're better utilizing the assets that we're all paying for. So to an extent, what you'll start to see is, along with smart meters, smart charging, and smart cars. That will mean, actually, the job of National Grid is slightly different, but it's, it's easy to manage. Is the sort of backbone of the National Grid up to supplying that power for maybe millions of electric cars on the road? Yes, yeah, so you will have seen, so the, the answer as a straight answer is yes, right. there is no problem. There is capacity yeah. on the transmission system to do this. Right. The challenge that we have though is this is the energy system trying to fix a transport problem. Right. We've never had to think about it in those terms before. And to an extent, the way our processes work as an industry are not nice and evenly matched. So we're right. trying to get to a point where we can be coordinated, think about what's best for the UK as a whole, so that actually EV drivers get a universal experience. You'll know that you can drive, say, 50 miles in any direction and meet an ultra-rapid charger. If you know that, you don't have to use it, but you have the confidence to travel anywhere. With Pivot Power, then, how soon do you think you're going to start stalling that? What are the plans for that in the future? Yeah, that's a good question. So since we went public with our plans um, the last couple of weeks, and I think that anecdotally, and I think this is a good example of this stuff, is there's a real interest and a real passion for this to happen. I mean, I came in last night, looked around, and I was like, wow, this is kind of lost. Like, wait, which hall are we in? And there's a buzz in this room. You could feel it when, when you walked around. And from our side, when we went public with these announcements, we didn't really think that anybody would care that much. And good God, there's a lot of attention. We're ta ta talking about billions and raising 1.1 billion pounds in the battery side of all of this. And that half a football pitch, we're going to do 45 of those. Um, and these do sound like ridiculous numbers. You know, we're talking two gigawatts and $1.1 billion. But those are the numbers we need to be talking about. I absolutely love innovation projects and demonstration projects, and that's fantastic. But this is an infrastructure problem that needs to be talking about infrastructure numbers. So anyway, that, but in terms of your question, <laughs> um, is that we will have our first site in Southampton, which has gone into planning. We'll look for that to come out of planning. Um, kind of late Q3 this year. Right. Um, we'll oh, this year? To, so there was well, some... coming out of planning, right. we'll look to have that operational um, right. by back end of Q2 next year. Um, we'll look to have the first 10 over the eight, next 18 to 24 months and the rest of the, the portfolio over the next five years. And there's two functions to the pace that those will roll out. One is the requirement and the need for balancing services and more storage to be on the network and the more renewables we have on that. Uh, the more kind of volatility essentially that is created. Um, but secondly is, is the uptake of EVs. So it becomes a really interesting income stream for that battery investment to essentially sell that electricity to a defined location. Now, that could be bus depots, that could be park and ride facilities, that could be taxi rinks, that could be motorway service stations, um, that could be fleet services for large corporate. Um, I say this, it, it sounds a bit, we don't care, but because we want to see where's the long hanging fruit and we can kind yeah. of unlock you know, the piece to the market um, and let that piece of the market really welcome that provision of power to, to make all this happen. So we, we're playing the long game. There's not a billion pounds and two gigawatts that's going to be slammed into the system tomorrow. That, that, that's right. not what's happening. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and Victor, I mean, how, how large is your network now? I mean, in terms of members or you, people who are using the system? It's early days, so you know, we launched the service in Q3 last year, and so right now that it's hundreds rather than thousands. Right. Um, the, the ultimate experience should be that um, 
once you've booked your charge point, you're instantly recognised as you, as you as you arrive at that charge point. For that to happen, sorry, thank you. <laughs> For that to happen, um, the charge points need to be connected. They need to use internet technology, um, technology, um, and, and to be able to talk. And so that, that's the phase two of our, our business, going right. beyond the launch, the scale that's building, the, the scale that's building nicely, and then using technology to to improve that that user experience. Thank you. And uh, Graham, the attitude to renewables is very positive. It's not like, oh, we don't want wind turbines and we don't want solar. But it is a disruption to the old style way that you would operate a power grid. I mean, it must, it must be complicated. Actually, it feels like it. Uh, Ten years ago, um, I was in the wind industry. I built eight large wind farms in Scotland. And when my first experience with National Grid was wind's not going to be big and renewables are not going to be important and it's kind of like green and you know, coal will keep the lights on. Yeah. But in that 10 years, look where we've got to and how the energy networks industry has welcomed clean generation. Yeah. But when you start to look at the transition to low carbon transport and electrification of vehicles, actually as an energy industry, it looks like it could be maybe twice as disruptive in half the time. So actually it's forcing these big, long-standing businesses to really soul search but what it does do is it excites engineers. It's new, yeah. it's challenging, it's exciting. It's a problem to be solved. You know, it's really interesting that we're suddenly seeing consumers engage with networks, whereas before they didn't. Yes. And so it's driving our engineers to really think really cleverly about solutions, and which is why instead of saying it can't be done, it's how will it be done. Yeah, I mean, that is very much an engineer's attitude to a problem. I've always loved that. I mean, that was something I picked up very strongly doing Scrap Eat for years, was that, you know, I'd see something that was going, well, that doesn't work, depressed, and then an engineer see, sees it and goes, that doesn't work, brilliant. <laughs> and that was, the, that was the big difference. We yeah. have hundreds of those. Yes, I've met. I've we met keep some. them in a dark place most of the time, <laughs> but yes, they get very excited. But thank you so much for coming. Thanks for your patience, and thank you to a fantastic panel. Please give them a great round of applause. Thank you.